Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me here to Saskatchewan. As someone who was born and raised in the plains of Kansas, there's a part of me that feels like I'm coming home being here. So delighted to be here today to talk to you about evidence-based psychotherapies for PTSD, as well as uh, a particular promising practice in the treatment of PTSD. Um, so I should just mention at the outset, I do not receive any funding from uh, various commercial organizations, but do receive royalties, albeit small, for, related to the publication of a couple of books that I'm going to talk about uh, in today's presentation. So I wanted to start with this slide, which frankly, we could probably spend an entire talk on just deconstructing the evidence base for the treatment of PTSD. I wanted to show you this summary slide. This is from a meta-analysis of treatments for PTSD that includes both psychosocial interventions, but also somatic interventions. And I especially like this meta-analysis because it includes the range of treatments that have been uh, used and tested in PTSD. So if you do not nightly read randomized clinical trials and are familiar with evidence-based uh, treatments and, and uh, effect sizes in particular, the thing you want to know is a bigger effect size is better. And you can think about it as standard deviations worth of difference or change that may help you. You do not want a negative effect, right? Because that would suggest that it is related to worsening. So one of the first things I want to say <clears throat> that actually was alluded to in our, our prior speaker's talk is that the, actually there's fairly good news about the treatment of PTSD, especially relative to other mental health conditions. So for example, um, in depression, the kind of average effect size for psychotherapy is about 0.87, for drugs about 0.3. So in, if you look just at the bars here, I mean, you're seeing quite large effects for improvements in PTSD. And we'll talk about these improvements in PTSD are also associated with improvements in other comorbid mental health conditions. So people's anxiety, their depression, their substance use, their functioning, et cetera. The other thing you probably will notice, and is also reflected in all the treatment guidelines that have been created to tell us a bit about how we should be practicing in the treatment of PTSD, is that psychotherapy is the frontline recommended treatment class for PTSD. And there are various ways of, of doing psychotherapy that have been shown to be efficacious. But relative to the somatic treatments, there is a relative advantage for these frontline treatments. Um, and specifically within the broader class of psychotherapies for PTSD, the trauma-focused interventions are the treatments that are often the, the most recommended in terms of the treatment of PTSD. And when we say trauma-focused treatment, what we mean is systematically taking people back and focusing on the trauma to help them move forward. And there are, there's different emphases depending on which package, treatment package that you choose, but those treatments that are processing the trauma are relatively more efficacious in the treatment of PTSD. So the green bars here are the psychosocial treatments. And so in this meta-analyses, meta they actually broke down the cognitive behavioral treatments to those uh, that are primarily cognitive, to those that include the cognitive, so looking at people's appraisals, but also are focused on their behaviors and having them face or confront those people, places, situations that are reminiscent of their traumatic experiences. Uh, then treatments that are primarily exposure-based, like prolonged exposure, would probably be the most well-known of those treatments that include both the marginal and in vivo exposure components. A treatment that's less known but is often the control condition in these trauma-focused treatments is 
Meikenbaum's uh, skills focus or stress inoculation training, which is mu much more on giving people skills, cognitive behavioral skills, uh, to improve coping with their symptoms, but are, is not necessarily taking them back to focus on their trauma. EMDR is also efficacious in the treatment of PTSD, not a question about that. Perhaps more of a question about what's the mechanism of action in terms of inducing those changes. And then you can see there are other psychosocial treatments like psychodynamic psychotherapy that has some efficacy, some efficacy for hypnotherapy, self-help. Uh, you'll notice the group effect is relatively small, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in terms of uh, the more general process-oriented groups do not seem to lead to a lot of improvements in PTSD, and even the trauma-focused interventions delivered in a group do not seem to be as efficacious as individual therapy. Biofeedback here has a negative effect. Um, there, I should say there are a few trials only, and this is peripheral uh, biofeedback, so uh, focused on skin conductance, and heart rate, um, so we can talk a little bit about the advances that have been made in terms of neurobiofeedback, um, in, uh, for example. Uh, acupuncture as a, a potential complementary strategy is showing some promise in terms of improvements in PTSD symptoms. There are some questions about um, the expectancy effects, because it's really hard to do sham acupuncture these days in terms of people getting acupuncture, but really not getting acupuncture. So finding kind of the, the control condition. Then you can see here that the drug treatments to date are relatively modest in terms of their effects. And most treat gu treatment guidelines uh, would actually recommend, for example, against the use of benzodiazepines in the treatment of PTSD. We can talk a little bit um, about how uh, the movement to use the medications as facilitators of psychotherapy uh, is coming along. But as standalone treatments, they have relatively more modest effects on PTSD symptoms. So what I want to focus on now are two therapies that are in this class of cognitive interventions for PTSD. And a bit about the theory that underlies them and kind of the characteristics or nature of those treatments. So starting with a cognitive theory of trauma processing. So why, wh how is it that we understand from a cognitive model that people can get stuck in their recovery? So as you heard, before, about 75% of North Americans are going to be exposed to a Criterion A traumatic event. So fortunately, 75% of Canadians are not walking around with PTSD. So how do we understand that actually there's a large number of people that are exposed but don't necessarily go on to have the disorder? And I've summarized here three different studies to, to kind of show this quote-unquote natural recovery that occurs uh, post-traumatization. So in Barbara Rothbaum's study, which is represented by the blue bars, they followed penetrative sexual assault victims or rape victims from one week up to 12 weeks. And they monitored their PTSD symptoms. And as you'll see, at first assessment, 94% of them would have met criteria for PTSD, but for that one month, one month uh, criteria in the disorder. And then you'll see over time that at 12 weeks or three months, about 50% of them will meet diagnostic criteria. And again, as reviewed earlier this morning, rape is one of the traumas that is most likely to lead to PTSD. You can see here in the yellow bars, this is Dave, Dave Riggs' study, where they studied a more heterogeneous sample of people who had been physically assaulted but not sexually assaulted. And the rates of PTSD were about 66% at one week, and then it declines over time. So one of the most important things, I think, to think about in PTSD when you're conceptualizing cases
is to think about PTSD not as a disorder that develops. So unlike schizophrenia, depression, where you might see these prodromal signs, that actually, for most people, the most significant symptoms are in the early hours, days, weeks following the trauma, and that over time, that course will be to a reduction of symptoms. So it's helpful to think about what gets in the way of a person having this natural recovery. And in the cognitive models of PTSD, you're thinking about what are people's pre-existing belief systems. So in this way, it actually is a developmental type of theory. So we're not assuming people are tabula rasa when they come to a trauma. All of us have a learning history, right, based on our experiences and how we construe the world, how we construe ourselves. And we bring that to our next experiences in life. And then what happens is a trauma comes along, and like other experiences, these are things we have to make sense of. So how do we understand this event that has occurred to us? And that's in conjunction to be reconciled with this prior learning history, our belief systems. So one of the things that people love to do, and years of cognitive psychology tells us, we love to assimilate new experiences and try to cram them into our existing belief systems. So we, we tend to be kind of cognitive misers. We can be a little bit lazy in how it is that we take in new information. So there is a tendency in general for people to want to make these new experiences fit with prior experiences. So just to kind of hearken you back to Piaget, way back when, what you learned about children will oftentimes take what they've experienced in the world and try to fit it into categories that they already have. So in the case of PTSD, you might come to the trauma thinking, OK, it's a, a just world, or even if you don't believe in the just world, that you believe in cause and effect, which evolutionarily makes sense, right? That I want to predict and control so I can understand what threat is in my environment. So I believe that, there, that I can predict what's safe, what's unsafe, um, and how I might be able to protect myself. I might have a relatively more positive uh, history. People can be trusted. I'm in control. A trauma comes along. And if I want to try to cram it into this prior belief system, then I might construe that event to maintain these beliefs. Right? So I might have a thought or, or appraise the trauma to say, I must have done something bad to deserve this. Because after all, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and there must have been something that I did that I got myself into this situation. Or I might, because I want to exert control over it, say, OK, it was my fault, or I could have prevented this. So I use hindsight bias as a strategy of trying to maintain that sense of control and predictability. You can imagine that these ways of thinking can get people in trouble in terms of that pattern of recovery over time. And in these models, we talk about people getting stuck in their recovery, again, imbuing hope to individuals that, in fact, if we can fix these mechanisms, that, that occurred in terms of your recovery, then we can get you unstuck in this process. Now, these models also take into account that not everyone has a lovely background, right, and have pre-existing positive beliefs. So some people come to the trauma maybe thinking I'm a bad person, People can't be trusted. I have no control over everything or anything. And what does the trauma do? It reinforces it, right? It's confirmed stuckness. So in this way, it's a confirmation bias, 
So this is yet another piece of information. In fact, this is a big piece of information that I am a bad person. So I deserved it. I knew I shouldn't have trusted him or her or see. This is just proof positive. I have no control. And in this way, it is this process of confirmed stuckness. Now, when people are trying to make sense of things, the other way that they can <clears throat> get tripped up in the recovery process is take the information that is in a traumatic event and overgeneralize their beliefs, those pre-existing belief systems. So they can go overboard in taking in that information. So <clears throat> by its very nature, Trauma is a time when people are unsafe. Oftentimes, the traumatic events that lead to PTSD involve a betrayal, so someone that they thought should protect them, a caregiver who didn't protect them, or an acquaintance who they thought was um, safe, who ended up sexually assaulting them. In those situations, they are powerless. So people will see those qualities of the trauma but then they'll radically change the other side of the equation in terms of their belief system. So now, when it comes to here and now beliefs, they might have previously thought, I can get close to other people. Now it's like, oh, I can't get close to anyone. Or the world is safe, previous thought, and now I'm thinking the world is completely unsafe. And this is a way that people also get stuck as they're thinking about the here and now and the future. The goal of these cognitive therapies is, and this is a really important piece, I think, to understand that it's, it's not Pollyanna therapy. So it's not to say the world is rosy and if you just think positive, then you're gonna feel better. It's really reality therapy is to help people accept and understand the realities of those traumatic experiences, which often do include the idea of betrayal, uh, that being unsafe, being powerless, and feeling the natural emotions that go along with that. There is a reality to those experiences that people sometimes want to deny and undo because it threatens their sense of their ability to keep them safe. And so part of it is allowing people the natural feelings that are associated with a realistic appraisal of the event, but also not going too overboard in how much they make of those events. So for example, the person may have to come to appreciate, change their mind, that bad things do happen to good people, right, which would be the antidote to the just world. A really important derivative of that that's relevant to first responders, to combat vet veterans, um, is <clears throat> sometimes really good people do bad things, right? Put people in the right situation, the right time, that sometimes the environment drives people's behavior way more than their character which as Westerners, we tend, we tend to think character is so important relative to the circumstances. You're also working to help people come to more balanced beliefs about I have power over many things, but not all things. Also, an antidote to hindsight bias is a different action might have had a bad outcome. So they, they tend to have happily ever th after thinking. So had I just done this, had I fought back, then I wouldn't have been raped not appreciating fighting back could have gotten them killed at the time. So it really is trying to engender a realistic, balanced way of looking backward in terms of those trauma appraisals that then has downward effects on how people take in information in the here and now and how they think about the future. So that leads us to this graphic. So Imagine you all decide to have a change of career, and you're going to become ecologist, and you're going to clean up this water source. Where would you start if you wanted to be as efficient as possible in cleaning up the water that is starting at the, at the top and flowing down to the bottom? 
at the top. And why would you do that? The source, thank you. And you would, in this way, go backward to go forward. So while I talked about all of these cognitive disruptions that can happen with traumatization, and other scholars have talked about, in these therapies, what makes them trauma-focused is that you are going back to look at the appraisals of how people took in the information about the trauma and their experiences in order to have downstream effects on how they think about the here and now and how they think about the future. Now, a couple of things about these treatments is that the cognitive treatments for PTSD do tend to be cooler versus the exposure treatments being hotter and more immersive. That doesn't mean there isn't affect or, or emotional processing that needs to occur. Because sometimes people, once they really see the event for what it is, there's a lot of natural affect that needs to run its course. Also, sometimes clients think, oh, if I do a cognitive therapy, then I don't have to necessarily talk about the past. These are still trauma-focused treatments because you are taking people backward in order to move them forward. Now, you'll notice that I use this term trauma-focused versus trauma treatment. I think this is a really important distinction, too, in how you're thinking about what you're doing with clients. You are not treating trauma. We can't treat trauma. We can't change what has happened to people. We can change their relationship. We can focus on those traumas to change their relationships to them. But part of what is powerful about these treatments is actually appreciating that we can't change the past and actually intervene on the trauma itself. We're working with the memories and the interpretations of uh, of the trauma and of those experiences. So one example of these cognitive therapies that is, in, is individually or group delivered is cognitive processing therapy, or CPT. Um, a little bit about this treatment uh, package. So it is grounded. Hold on, I've got to adjust my Britney Spears paraphernalia here. I was very excited to get to wear this today. Um, it is grounded in this social cognitive theory that I just mentioned. It is designed to be 12 sessions long. So when it was initially developed and tested, we always tested it as 12 sessions. And then it was like, well, what's magical about 12? Why do we assume it has to be 12? When we did that in order for, like, for the science, right, because you have to have a, a dose. And since we have experimented with determining when someone's done based on their response to their PTSD symptoms, their comorbid depression, and when they think they're done. So people um, have been shown to have a response as early as five sessions, and we've tested it up to 18 sessions to get people uh, to have the, the desired response uh, with greater dosing. As I mentioned before, it is trauma-focused. A major part of the intervention um, as we've developed is the use of Socratic dialogue. So the idea of asking questions to bring a client along into their own knowledge, consistent with the idea that people do have this inherent um, wisdom, and, it's, and part of what's powerful is having them come to that. And you're really a, a co-passenger along with them in that process of discovery. It is sequential, so it's not a Chinese buffet where you pick and choose sessions. It is designed to initially, like other trauma-focused treatments, provide psychoeducation and a rationale for the treatment, so it's very transparent about how we think the client can recover. And then there's an initial assimilation, initial focus on assimilation of the traumatic events, so going backward really focusing on their, their particular thoughts about why the event happened. There is the option to use a written account. So initially, in its initial development, we had tested it with written accounts. We then figured out that actually people 
got better faster, and we had way less dropout if people do, didn't do written accounts. Um, and so therefore, uh, there's an option. The one predictor of who does better with written accounts is the dissociative subtype. So it seems to have a grounding effect for people and probably helps them put together the trauma memory that has been so fragmented by, by virtue of writing. And then in the treatment, there's a later focus on those over-accommodate beliefs or those over-generalized beliefs after you've done as much as you can to clean up the historical trauma appraisals. Um, as I said before, there is the original version that um, included written accounts, and that has been tested in group, individual, and their combination. And then CPT, uh, which we refer to now without the written accounts based on the, the dismantling trials, that has been tested in individual and group formats. As of now, there are 23 randomized controlled trials in a range of traumatized individuals with PTSD. So it's been, uh, for example, it's been tested in the Congo with women who are currently under threat of civil war um, and <clears throat> who were not literate. It was delivered by high school educated paraprofessionals. It's been tested with the military. It's been tested um, in battered women's shelters. So it's been tested in a range of traumatized individuals with PTSD um, and with PTSD having a range of comorbidities alongside the disorder. Across these trials, it shows significant improvements in PTSD and the likely co-travelers with PTSD, so depression, anxiety, guilt, uh, functioning, and we have tested the effects five to 10 years later. So we followed people uh, to see if, in fact, the effects sustained. And consistent with these, these treatments for PTSD that are going after the cause and not just symptom management, once you improve people's PTSD, not only do they have a, a sustained remission, but they also, if re-exposed, are less likely to get PTSD and are less likely to get exposed. So it says something about really going after what we think are the, uh, the causes of PTSD. There's been one study where we directly compared the individual versus group format. And in that study, it was with US active duty military members, mostly men, the individual treatment outperformed the group format. Um, and consistent with that slide that I showed at the beginning, I think the real issue with group delivery is that it's hard to give a sufficient dose <clears throat> of the intervention to each person in the group because people's traumas are so ideographic and trying to get at those appraisals can be really hard when you're looking for uh, common cognitions in a group. We also now have what are called implementation trials where we're actually taking and training uh, clinicians who are learning the therapy and supporting them in the delivery. Um, in fact, we just completed a trial here in Canada where we had 134 clinicians who learned the therapy and we provided consultation uh, to them and we found effects similar to the efficacy trials. So when we support these clinicians in actually delivering the treatment, they're finding effects with their patients in frontline practice similar to what we're finding in our highly controlled, you know, lab delivered with graduate students closely monitored types of studies. Um, just a little bit about now taking it beyond like does it work, for whom does it work and why might it work are some really interesting questions that are, that are emerging in the psychotherapy literature for PTSD. Um, in general, men and women have similar outcomes if they have civilian traumas. But an interesting pattern in all of the treatments for PTSD is that men generally who have combat military experiences are less responsive to our available treatments. Whether that has to do with a particular kind of trauma or perhaps the healthcare systems in which they're situated and some of the, the um, 
economic and social implications of changes in, in their symptoms, I think is an important thing for us to continue to look at. Um, there have been some efforts to look at participant ethnicity and race. There are no differences in the treatment outcome. Um, in this case, it was an American sample. The African-American women were more likely to drop out, but interesting, um, the African-American women seemed to have a, a response that was earlier in the treatment, which might account for them dropping out earlier in the treatment. Uh, there's a little bit of research on the era of veterans. Uh, so OEF, OIF, meaning Iraq, Afghanistan, Stan, American veterans. The younger veterans, the, the more recent generation, seems to have bigger treatment gains, but they're also more likely to drop out from the treatment. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, per, we, we've never ruled out people based on personality disorder diagnoses, and so one of the questions has been, well, what about people who might have BPD or more complex PTSD presentations? Do they do as well in the treatment? Um, and in fact, these uh, characteristics do not predict treatment outcome. They tend to start sicker and have a steeper trajectory of improvement over the course of treatment. What I would say clinically is that they tend to be more challenging for the clinician who is treating them uh, to keep them engaged in the model and the, the interpersonal processes within those sessions can be more challenging, but they seem to respond. Uh, we have always included people with substance use problems. Um, early on, ruling out dependence, but more recently not in our trials. And we found no differences in the outcomes uh, with current or past alcohol use disorders, and also have evidence that it works in individuals who have traumatic brain injuries. As I said before, there are improvements in a range of conditions. Um, I think it's also important to say, and I get this, I get this um, critique, is like, okay, great, Candace, you improve these individual symptoms, but what about the broader psychosocial functioning? also physical health concerns, um, and we have documented that there are improvements in health concerns, occupational functioning, uh, their, even their economic status, and social leisure involvement and intimacy and sexual concerns. So really trying to think beyond just these individual conditions to think about uh, broader functioning with the treatment. There's also some really interesting data emerging about how to dose the treatment. So in our trials, we typically deliver the treatment twice a week. Um, and in clinical practice, sometimes people are de delivering it more akin to once a week. And the available evidence says that more frequent sessions is actually associated with better outcomes. Um, which, uh, you know, as someone who's ex kind of experimented with different dosing, I think there's something powerful about getting people in overcoming the avoidance that's associated with doing the trauma-focused work and having a sense of mastery, because a lot of people want to procrastinate in uh, doing the work. In terms of fidelity to the treatment, meaning are you delivering it as prescribed, in fact, there is evidence that the, the closer people follow the manual, the better their outcomes, and I think probably the structure in and of itself <clears throat> of these trauma-focused treatments are key to, to overcoming um, some of the avoidance that maintains the disorder. And one thing to remember that, that's consistent with what I was saying before is that we probably shouldn't assume in our interventions that dropout is necessarily a treatment failure. That for some people, actually, they improve sooner than the prescribed amount of sessions in these interventions and really encouraging you to think about symptom monitoring or uh, measurement-based care to understand what are, what are our treatment targets and are we meeting the criterion as we're going along in the provision of the treatment. Okay, so to pivot just a little bit, I wanted to talk about one of the promising cognitive therapies for PTSD. Um, an intervention that, <clears throat> that I am first author of and have been testing in trying to bring the social factors of PTSD that we know are so important 
in the onset of the disorder, but also in intervening on it. So what my colleagues and I are doing is really trying to bring the social to biopsychosocial models of PTSD. And so it's not to say that the polymorphis polymorphisms on the serotonin gene transporter system don't matter, but how does that interact with people's interpersonal functioning, their sociocultural context that may really influence how they react after traumatization and how they might recover. So <clears throat> that leads us to um, looking at the risk factors for PTSD. And, and these are actually two meta-analyses that, that have mathematically looked at cross studies. What are the factors that are related to a PTSD diagnosis? And I think it's, it's really helpful for us to look at these studies, because it helps us check some of our potential assumptions and biases about why people end up with PTSD. So for example, childhood abuse, other adverse childhood experiences is correlated with PTSD, but relatively lower correlations than post-traumatic factors. So for example, in these two meta-analyses, for example, you will see that post-traumatic social support emerges as the most consistent and robust predictor of who is going to be diagnosed with PTSD, which frankly is a bit of good news because this is a factor that we can manipulate, right? It's a dynamic factor that we might be able to do something with either in the early days post-traumatization or after people actually have the disorder. Now, a couple of things to know about this social support finding is that it appears that social support, negative social support, which is kind of a funny way of talking, but negative social reactions after traumatization is more potent than positive reactions are protective. So it's more of a risk factor than it is a resilience factor. Even though we talk about social support as a resilience factor, it appears that the lack of people's emotional support in particular is associated with the, with the onset of PTSD. The other thing to know is that it's really about perceived interactions so the, on the part of the traumatized individual than it really is about objective support, which is consistent with the broader social support uh, literature. So let me just try to sell you on the five top reasons to think about doing a conjoint therapy for PTSD. And you'll notice I'm saying conjoint. Most of our data is with couples. However, we have included a range of others, and we call them concerned significant others. So whether that you know, is a parent or we've had sisters, we've had a mother-son dyad who had experienced um, physical abuse by the father. It's really the idea of enlisting concerned significant others in PTSD treatment. So number five, drum roll. Oh, seriously, it'll, it'll wake you up. <laughs> Thank you, well done is it's highly associated with relationship problems. Um, so, and, and that makes sense, right? So trauma occurs in an interpersonal context, whether it's at the hands of another person or it's simultaneously experienced at a community level. It's a very interpersonal phenomenon and therefore not a shock that people will then have interpersonal problems. And someone having PTSD symptoms and being in relation to them can be very hard on the relationship. So there's, the, and data supports this. So there's a bi-directional relationship between the symptoms of the disorder and relationship problems. Now, while we have these individual therapies that work and they're good, not, they're not a panacea, right? So there, there are partial responses to them. Uh, the, the data suggests that about 75% of people who complete the treatments will, will have a remission in their diagnosis, but only about 50% of people who even start them 
will have a remission, right, once you account for dropouts. So we have to figure out how to innovate uh, the treatments to help more people. The other thing to think about is that the existing therapies don't improve intimate relationship functioning. So I mentioned, you know, these broader effects on occupational functioning and social leisure and their, their broader social context, it does not improve intimate relationship functioning. So while we might think, oh, if I fix the PTSD, it'll have these trickle-down effects, um, that has not been shown to be true in the literature. The other really important thing for you to be thinking about as you're treating individuals with PTSD is that the interpersonal milieu in which they are existing while they are doing these noxious treatments is really important. So if people are in family environments or interpersonal environments that are not supportive, where there's hostility, they're not gonna respond as well to your individual interventions. So trying to do at least something to make more fertile soil for, even if you're gonna do individual interventions, what can you do to improve um, or mitigate some of those negative uh, characteristics to improve the potency and the engagement uh, in your intervention? And then finally, pragmatically, how can you get multiple outcomes from a single therapy. So in this case, how can we improve individual PTSD, comorbid conditions, but also improve the relationship and potentially the partner who is taking part in the therapy? Now, a really helpful thing to think about is when you are doing couple family therapy, we tend to think about it as an adjunctive intervention. Right, so we're seeing someone in individual treatment for depression or uh, some GAD, and they, we know they have relationship problems, so we refer them to someone to do couple therapy or family therapy. That's kind of typically how we think about couple family models and couple family therapy. And that's consistent with this quadrant of thinking, right? So our target isn't necessarily to improve an individual disorder, but we're trying to improve the relationship. So yeah, if we improve the relationship, we might change the ambient stress that's going on to improve the individual problem, but we're not presuming that the couple family therapist is gonna intervene directly on the individual problem. Now, there are also interventions that are called partner-assisted interventions where you might include a loved one in the treatment like a surrogate coach or therapist, like a coach or a surrogate therapist. So um, the most common example of this in the literature is someone who has panic disorder and agoraphobia. And you bring the, the partner in and you're trying to coach them about how to help with the exposures in having people go out and um, go outside of the house. Now, one thing to think about with these partner-assisted interventions is that they're okay and may actually be better than individual treatment in some studies if the relationship is healthy. But the minute it's not, then you can play into some of the power dynamics and also create an, or create an imbalance that can make actually the partner-assisted intervention problematic in terms of the delivery of the individual intervention um, and create family-level problems. There are some interventions that are developing in PTSD that are about using the family to help with engagement and also retention in the treatment. So the kind of common example in most PTSD clinics is that they will offer a family psychoeducation group that has some basic information about PTSD and maybe some basic skills that they're offering. There is no evidence to date in the literature that actually psychoeducation groups improve individual PTSD. Now it may help in terms of the person with PTSD engaging in the treatment, retaining 
or, or, or staying in the treatment, but not evidence of that alone helping PTSD. There's also some efforts to do phone coaching with loved ones about the kinds of things that they can say to try to get their loved one into treatment. There's this quadrant of interventions that are called disorder-specific family therapies that are therapies that have been designed to not only try to improve their relationship, but are simultaneously targeting the individual problem. So in the areas of substance use, in the areas of depression, there are some, some interventions that have actually been shown to be better than individual in terms of maintaining the gains, but also getting relationship effects. And CBCT for PTSD is part of this class of interventions. So in this way, it is a standalone treatment. It's not an add-on. It's a, it's a frontline treatment for PTSD and the enhancement of intimate relationships. We do talk about the trauma, but consistent with these cognitive models at a 30,000 foot view, and more about how do you think about what happened. Also looking at loved ones' own trauma appraisals. Sometimes they have very problematic ways of thinking about the trauma that you also need to address. So, for example, the, the parent that says, oh my God, why did you go to the bar alone? Right, so try, trying again to deal with their own distress, but inadvertently sending this very invalidating message uh, to their loved one. It is designed to be 15 sessions. The sessions are designed to be 75 minutes lo uh, long. We've tested it with kind of the typical inclusion exclusion criteria for PTSD, trying to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, we have more data on partners where there or uh, couples where one person has PTSD, but we do have data where both people have PTSD in the couple. The only couples that we exclude are those couples where there's severe violence. We allow more minor uh, violence, but target it in the intervention. And they have to commit to at least the 15 sessions of therapy, even if they're thinking of ending the relationship. Uh, just quickly, there are three phases. Um, the first phase is really about why are you here doing this intervention together? How does PTSD exist as a relational disorder? So externalizing the disorder out of the, the identified patient and putting it between them and talking about how PTSD lives in relationships. So how it might cause people not to sleep in the same bed together. How it might uh, relate to one partner accommodating the symptoms by running a lot of interference to try to, to decrease the distress for the person with the disorder. And also conflict management. I would say if you're practicing individual therapy, whatever individual therapy you might be practicing for PTSD, the content in these first two sessions may be highly relevant to use if you wanted to bring a loved one in just to give them some frame and understanding of the treatment that you're doing and to try to decrease the most negative behaviors that are going on in the relationship to try to improve your individual treatment. Phase two is largely behavioral, where we're trying to improve communication, but we're also trying to overcome the avoidance that maintains the disorder. So we're systematically encouraging approach assignments where we're getting people to go out and face those trauma-related cues and activities that are simultaneously improving the relationship. So going for dinner, or going to family activities. So trying to get a twofer, if you will. And then the third phase is really where the trauma processing occurs. So where we're enlisting the dyad to actually work together on cognitions that either of them may have that maintain the disorder or is problematic about the trauma appraisal. So just very briefly, if you're interested, we've tested it. Um, in five uncontrolled studies, some interesting um, delivery questions. So one of them, 
is we delivered the entire uh, phases one and two in a retreat format. So over a Friday night, a Saturday, and a Sunday morning with shockingly good effects. So there may be something about mass dosing uh, the intervention. We have also tested it alongside MDMA administration or ecstasy, molly uh, on the street to try to facilitate um, the effects of the treatment, giving it to both members of the dyad. And uh, we have also tested it against prolonged exposure, which is a well-established individual therapy for PTSD, uh, showing superior effects in terms of the PTSD symptoms, but also relationship functioning. Um, and then in the interest of time, I'll just say that we are finding broader outcomes in terms of parenting. So in terms of people's efficacy and satisfaction in parenting, also emotion regulation, emotional aggression, post-traumatic growth, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, one, some of the uh, kind of interesting things have to do with moderators. So sometimes people would say, oh, this would be a great treatment if I have a distressed couple. Um, and in fact, the treatment seems to work whether or not the couple is in distress or not. Um, I would say a better predictor of who might benefit from uh, this treatment has to do with our data on those people who have especially high emotional numbing symptoms, so having difficulty connecting with and feeling their feelings. Those symptoms are not particularly responsive with our existing individual treatments, and we seem to have a good effect by bringing a loved one in uh, by evoking more emotion. There's nothing like having your significant other in the office with you to be more evocative in terms of emotions. Um, and the other case of um, presentation that I think m you might think about this intervention is in relationships where there is someone who's highly accommodating. So you have a partner who is doing all the driving, let's say, for example, someone who's had a motor vehicle accident, and the partner is then driving their loved one around. Or the, the partner has taken on a lot of the, ho the household tasks so that their loved one can kind of bunker in. Those are cases where I think it's really important to somehow address, whether this treatment or, or some other strategy, the accommodation that is existing interpersonally that is going to be really difficult for you to affect change on without buy-in in the environment. Okay, so just as we round out to talk a little bit about future directions with CPT, so we are really working about working to try to increase access. So trials that are aimed at trying, what, you know, what are the best methods, what are the evidence-based methods to train clinicians to do these, these methods um, in implementation trials? Um, my team is working on specifically treating people who have P PTSD and BPD with self-injury and suicidality. So this is a group that we often think, oh, they need a phase-based treatment in order to have more regulatory skills. We're actually working to take them immediately to do a trauma-focused treatment and simultaneously address the suicidality and potential self-harm alongside the trauma-focused treatment instead of staging it. Um, because the evidence is pretty clear that DBT does not improve PTSD, but PTSD treatment improves the outcomes that we often are thinking about in terms of DBT. Um, there's also some efforts afoot to do essentially camps, CPT camps. So bringing people in for mass dosing so they get therapy every day in an intensive format. In fact, there's a really interesting uh, podcast about this type of delivery that was done by This American Life uh, by a journalist who underwent CPT and then nine months later actually developed a, a podcast about her experiences and lets you into some of her therapy sessions and her musings about what it was like to do the treatment. 
In terms of CBCT for PTSD, we currently are testing a combination of the treatment plus parent management for those people, those couples who have a child to see if we can get broader family effects. There's a very large trial going on right now in the USVA where we're taking it to, into people's homes and seeing if we can get the same effects by delivering it via video versus face-to-face. -face. We are also developing an online coached version of the intervention, so taking it right to the consumer uh, for individuals who may not otherwise be willing to come in for treatment because of their geographical dispersion or stigma or just don't want to sit and talk with a the therapist. Um, so we're trying to uh, develop that. And we're interested in uh, more systematically testing this idea of it really truly being a conjoint intervention, so not just intimate couples. Uh, we are ramping up to do a randomized controlled trial of the MDMA co the facilitation, because um, that first trial was not with a control condition. We've also developed a non-trauma-focused version of the intervention. So if we just talk about here and now thoughts that might be related to their relationship and related to the PTSD, can we get the same effects for those people who don't want to go back and talk about the trauma? Um, and then finally, a, a more aspirational trial that we're headed toward is really trying to account for patient preference in treatment. So a lot of our trials, people are, people are randomized, right, which is the part of the power of the methodology, but we know it's really clear in, this, uh, in psychotherapy literature in general, if people get randomized to the condition they want, they have better outcomes. Surprise, right? We come around and tell you all what you already know. Um, so there are actually designs where you can allow people to choose or say they won't do certain interventions to be able to then match preference uh, with the condition that they receive. And this is really relevant as it relates to the couple therapy because in our prolonged exposure versus couple therapy for PTSD trial, when people did not get the couple therapy, they dropped out. So the dropout rate was about 66% in the trial because people were coming there wanting the couple therapy, and if they didn't get it, then they were leaving the trial. So it's a, it's a really important thing for us to think about in terms of meeting people where they're at, what hurts for them, and trying to give them the treatment it is that they need and want. So with that, I think I'm pretty close to on time for questions and answers. Um, the uh, people who are joining us via live stream that oh, you can uh, send your questions to the uh, email that I had sent out last night um, and then I will read out the questions for Dr. Manson. Great, thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming and for the presentation. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the training um, for both types of therapy in yeah. terms of what's involved and length and... Yeah. So. Um, as of now, we have a standard training um, in each of them. It's a two-day workshop. And then, um, interestingly, we tested a couple of different ways of helping people post-workshop. And having post-workshop consultation matters to patient outcomes. Um, so, so now we recommend that people come to the workshop and then do six months of consultation post-workshop where they're in groups talking about the delivery because that's when you realize what you don't know and what do you do with this particular presentation and to have an expert and a group to help you along with that. Um, so that's what's recommended. The truth is anyone in this room could go buy the book and practice the intervention, uh, but we do find better outcomes if people are part of the post-consultation process. And then there's an option for people, if they want to have their sessions rated for fidelity, then they can be rated as a quality rated provider, and they go on our website. Thank you. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, can you speak a little bit more about the modifications to the CPT protocol when there's comorbid BPD? Yeah, so uh, the question, in case you couldn't hear that, was about what, what we're thinking about in terms of this comorbidity. So what we are doing is um, there's um, some work on psychiatric case management, which is just really doing a good safety plan and monitoring of people's suicidality and desire to self-injure alongside the CPT. So it's, it's not a particular, we're trying to simplify it, frankly. So like, what is the bare minim, minimum? What's the pars most parsimonious way we can manage these behaviors alongside of the CPT? The other part we changed is the psychoeducation about the role of self-injury and suicidal ideation and planning as it relates to distress tolerance and management. So a lot of people will say that they're using these behaviors as escape strategies, right, when they are feeling emotionally distressed. So weaving that into the rationale of like, this is why we are going straight to the trauma to try to get the distress down so that you have less desire to do these other behaviors um, that are a strategy for dealing with your distress but actually are maintaining the cycle of symptoms. Yes, sir. Hey. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, <laughs> thank you, yeah, it was a very exciting presentation, all the, the cool projects you guys are doing in the future. This is very exciting for me. Um, thank you. Had a question, uh, so I'm more familiar with some of the more uh, psychodynamic therapies. Sure. And an article that came out recently uh, wasn't making a criticism of the cognitive ones, but uh, one of the authors had, well, there was making a point of, what do you do for people that do a cognitive type of therapy around trauma? Say the, the cognitive therapy, for whatever reason, is insufficient, or you know yeah. they drop out or something like that. What are your thoughts about people doing a different form of therapy after? I'm just curious if that's something you've yeah. looked at for people yeah, yeah, who have yeah. done one, and then you know maybe they need more or something. Yeah, so I'm gonna expand, if it's okay, to talk just more generally about people who don't respond the first time. So whether you transition to a psychodynamic or another trauma-focused therapy. So we used to think, oh, wow, and I used to say this, I'm embarrassed to say, it's like, ooh, an initial poor response to one of these evidence-based treatments is a, is a poor, prognos poor prognostic indicator for their response to a subsequent one. And now there are two studies that have come out that actually say when people got a second round of these evidence-based treatments, that they had a good response. So I think that's a hopeful message for all of us not to assume that just because they don't respond the first time, that they won't respond a second or perhaps a third time. We haven't, we haven't tested it that far out. I think when it comes to these, this battleground about the psychotherapies for PTSD, what's most important is that you're offering a treatment that works, and from there, it's up, it's up to the client about what do they want. In an ideal world, if patients get to choose what it is that makes sense to them, they do better. And so um, I think the rationale and making sure they understand the rationale and that making sense to them is really important to treatment expectancy, and treatment expectancy is really important to outcome. And there is developing... Um, research on the interpersonal therapies, both short-term and long-term. Um, so I, I think it's great for people to measure what you're doing. That's my most important message, is to measure what you're doing. Thank you. So when we're talking about a lot of these therapies in the context of PTSD, yeah. talking about meeting a certain type of criteria, yeah. and one of that is having the symptoms for a month. Um, so I'm wondering if you might be able to speak to your approach when we have patients who come to us before they've had the symptoms for the one month period. Yeah, yeah, really good question. So um, based on this idea of tracking people over time, I would not do anything in the first month unless they do meet acute stress disorder symptoms. And remember that acute stress disorder, a major requirement with ASD is dissociation. So, and, and we do know that dissociation is a predictor of who will, who will go on to have the disorder. 
So I, unless it's at the, the kind of highest level, I would do active surveillance, like watchful waiting, and see how they are coming along before intervening. Um, the truth is, we, we just finished a, a study where we didn't intervene. We just followed people over a year. And even after three months, people are still getting better. So I think there's an argument for even a longer period of active surveillance, especially if the client's not really wanting to engage. That's probably the worst case scenario is us forcing people to engage, which incidentally is, I think, why, why the psychological debriefing studies did not do well and showed iatrogenic effects is because they were forcing people to participate in these group de debriefing strategies and probably forcing anyone to engage in an early intervention is a bad idea. And that's, it's much more important just to monitor how they're coming along. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I just have a question about how you would proceed. I'm seeing a lot more couples where there may not mm. be physical violence. Mm. However, there may, may be fairly extreme psychological violence. Yeah and maybe some narcissistic patterns underneath. Yes. And we may have uh, a client who is actually traumatized within the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, how do you screen mm -hmm. uh, treating the, that type of a scenario or within a family if the family is the support member? Yeah. How do you proceed and how do you screen when there's that kind of psychological abuse with the support person? Right, yeah, really good question. So. Um, we use a conflict tactic scale to determine the more minor versus severe acts, which is a very behaviorally anchored measure. But we also ask about people feeling safe in the relationship. Because the truth is, and, and you're kind of alluding to this, is I might not be able, I might not have to lift a finger and you're scared. Like that's, that might be the best perpetration. Um, so making sure people feel safe as part of it. I think the other piece is in proceeding is do people feel, do people see their aggression, either emotional or physical, as a problem? And if one person doesn't see it as a problem, I wouldn't proceed in doing the couple therapy until, unless there was mutual agreement about that behavior being a target behavior or a targeted outcome of the intervention. Yeah. I'm just curious if you can please go over why, if you think dissociation is a bad idea, um, then like, for example, ketamine is a dissociative and it's shown a lot of promise in treatment. So I'm wondering if you can like explain that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so dissociation is a bad idea. Say more. Um, I'll speed up. Um, well, like you said before the trauma, like dissociation leads to like more symptoms with PTSD or has a higher correlation to later. Yeah. So why do you think that? when they're treated with something like ketamine, that it actually is helpful and it's heard a lot of promise. Yeah, so I think ketamine is a bit of a paradox because that early research was they actually used ketamine to induce flashbacks in PTSD. And now there is potential for ketamine as a treatment. So again, I'm not a psychopharmacologist, so I should stay in my box. Um, what I read is that there may be dosing differences. I also think um, it, ketamine is not just something that induces dissociation or flashbacks, right? It has other mechanisms of action. So it may be that it also is acting on the depressive symptoms, which is activating for people to then engage in a PTSD treatment. So I don't, I don't see it as only inducing dissociation or flashback, that, that it's probably more nuanced than that in terms of understanding the effects. Five more minutes. I'm standing between you and that buffet, which is never a desirable position to be in. Just have a brief yes, question sir. about your experience with uh, somebody who might have neurocognitive impairments. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you mentioned traumatic brain injury, yeah. but uh, I have a few clients that have severe alcoholism, military yeah. veterans, and I don't know if they're yeah, yeah, cognitively yeah. able to take in any yeah. of the reprocessing. Yeah. 
So really, I mean, great question, first of all, because I think a lot of people, either during the traumatic event, have brain injury, or because of some of the behaviors that people may use in coping, substance use, et cetera, um, that they will have comorbid cognitive problems. Um, <clears throat> there is at least one study showing um, that actually people with more severe TBIs did better than those with the mild moderate levels of TBI with CPT. And I think it may have to do um, with the people who have more severe TBI that the clinicians were much better at appreciating their cognitive problems using the simplified worksheets in order to, to really make sure the concepts were understandable to them, so, so met them more where they were at. Um, th this is a place where I would also thinking of, think about bringing a loved one into the intervention to help generalize the, the knowledge and the skills outside of the session that may be particularly helpful um, in terms of getting the effects. I, I've treated a number of people. My first trial was with Vietnam veterans with CPT, and a lot of them had cognitive impairments. Um, and I think it's, what's really important is just that making the concepts as simple as possible when you're delivering the intervention. Um, that, that's really important. We also have tested it down to people who have IQs of 70. So, and, and one thing I say to people is in some ways people who are less psychologically complex and sophisticated, it's almost easier to treat than it is um, people who have more cognitive impairments. Ma'am. Hi, I, um, on your slide, it had indicated that biofeedback was not particularly mm. effective, and I, I thought I heard you suggest that neural feedback might yeah. be a different kettle of fish. Yeah. Did you want to touch on that? Sure. So um, just to say a little bit about the, the biofeedback, so the peripheral biofeedback is people have talked about the negative effect potentially being that you're sensitizing people to their anxiety. And so that, that actually can heighten people's um, anxiety in general and PTSD symptoms in particular. So in fact, this morning I, I did a review to see how many trials of neurofeedback there's been, and there has been one, one randomized controlled trial thus far with some promising effects. Um, so I think, and, and there's good effects in ADHD. So I think there is potentially a place for that. Um, one of the things I think it's interesting in the area is people are experimenting with different um, interfaces. So there's some fMRI feedback where they're actually taking people to their traumas and having people control the, the waves um, instead of just more generally a more diffuse strategy of changing the brain waves. So I, th I think it'll be interesting to see where that all goes. And I think my major question is how sustained the effects are gonna be over time uh, because it, it really is something, well, first of all, it seems like you have to have a number of sessions. So it's anywhere between 20 and 40 of these sessions. And then I think the questions are going to be around maintenance dosing um, and whether it, it is more similar to the drug trials where once you take that away, once you remove the drug, you titrate the drug, the effects go away. So I think those are some of the interesting questions that are going to come with regard to neurofeedback.